been thinking about this book a long time, and there's too much to say, of course. So you can easily design a semester's course around Frankenstein, even just having students read all of the books that Frank, that the monster himself read, for example. So I'm going to try and keep this quick. Um, I'm, I'm sure I'm going to miss a lot of fun things. OK. Oh, well, maybe not. That would be why. That's okay. We can move the keyboard over, I think, where you can use the mouse. I can use the mouse, that's okay. And that might work with both of you, too. Um, okay, perfect. Huh. It's as if it's gone to sleep. cartoon image of, of uh, Frankenstein's monster comes from a blog post that presents the argument, which is very commonplace, both in popular work on the novel and critical work, that Frankenstein, Victor Frankenstein, the scientist, was an irresponsible father, an irresponsible scientist, essentially a deadbeat dad. And you see this a lot. Um, but of course, uh, that might be true of cartoon versions of Frankenstein, but it's certainly not true of the novel, as we'll see. Um, the novel depicts a far more complex social origin for the problems of the monster. So, Frankenstein begins on a dark and stormy night, or a dark and stormy afternoon, or in any case it wouldn't really matter, because 1816 was the wettest, coldest summer on record in Europe. Um, this is a beautiful Turner. Alas, this is 1842, not 1816. But um, that summer influenced artists all over the world, and I'm sure. Turner didn't forget it. Okay, so the climate crisis of 1816 is a result of a volcanic eruption in 1815 on the island of Sumbawa. I'm sure some of you know about this already. It's quite famous. There have been a number of books on the subject. Um, this explosion of Tambora was 10 times bigger than the 1991 Mount Pinatubo eruption and 100 times more powerful than Mount St. Helens, which some of us in the room can remember. Um, Quite by chance, I was just a child at the time, but I was picnicking with my parents near the base of the mountain. So I have a vivid memory of all of a sudden it's snowing uh, in May. It was pretty disturbing. So I can only imagine what this explosion would have been like. Um, thousands of people were killed, of course, but what it did to the world's climate was pretty remarkable. So because all of this, um, all the sulfur aerosols in the stratosphere it changed the environment. Essentially, a gaseous surge morphed into a global haze, and it only reflected back a fraction of the incoming sunlight. So the world cooled, essentially, and that had terrible consequences. Frosts and cold weather uh, in America, and a year without a summer in many parts of the world. Uh, it broke the monsoon cycle in Asia, and it sent India into famine and triggered a cholera epidemic, among other things. So 1816 was a very strange year. People actually thought the world was ending. Um, there were all sorts of uh, apocalyptic narratives that were written in that summer. OK, so Mary Shelley, uh, before she was Mary Shelley, was Mary Wollstonecraft Godwin. And she was not quite 17 when she eloped with Shelley. Shelley had been working with her father, William Godwin. We'll come to him in a moment. Um, but yes, essentially, she was quite young when she left home. Um, Percy Shelley was already married to a woman named Harriet. We'll skip over that for the moment. But um, essentially, they were married legally in 1818. But in 1816, they went to Europe with uh, Mary's stepsister, Claire Claremont, who, was, who had been involved with Byron. Um, you all remember Byron, right? She walks in beauty like the night of clouds, climbs, and starry skies. Um, Anyhow, he was uh, infamous for good and bad behavior. And they decided to go and visit him. So he was renting the Villa Diadi on Lake Le Mans. And there, with his physician, John Polidori, for weeks they talked about literature, science, and philosophy. And of course, it was a wet, dark summer. And so they couldn't go outside and play, essentially. Um, they decided, in fact, to hold a horse story competition, which led Shelley to begin drafting what would become one of the most popularized novels 
of the 19th century in probably the most popularized novel ever written in English, anyway. So Polidori began his lesser known novel, The Vampire. It's not bad, it's not Bram Stoker, but you know, if you have the time and the energy, I recommend reading it, if only to see how much better Frankenstein is um, than The Vampire. So Mary Shelley was the brilliant, well-read daughter of two really important, influential social thinkers, William Godwin and, of course, Mary Wollstonecraft. So if you have a chance to read Vindication of the Rights of Women, I highly recommend it. It's surprisingly readable, given the period in which it's written. Caleb Williams is less good, but, um, but was beloved of Godwin's contemporaries. So these are both important, radical thinkers. And Mary Shelley grew up in the shadow of these two imposing figures. Um, and I think with Frankenstein, she was trying to find her own canvas for social thought. So, Frankenstein is in part a rewriting of the Faust story. Has anyone read uh, Goethe's Faust or Christopher Marlowe's Dr. Faustus? Okay, a few people. Well, if you get the chance, uh, Goethe's Faust, the one to read is the Walter Kaufman translation. It makes a really big difference which translation you read. Um, Frankenstein, as I said, is a rewriting of the Faust story. The Faust story is out of an overreacher, an alchemist or scholar whose desire for knowledge leads him to sell his soul to the devil, or a devil, depending upon the version. Shelley would have read, of course, the two versions I mentioned. Um, book one of Faust was published in 1808, book two a bit later. And Goethe's version is still considered by many to be the single greatest work of German literature, so again, I, I urge you to read it if you have the time. Don't be put off by the fact that it is essentially one long poem. So this illustration uh, comes from a 20th century edition, but it gives you, I, I think, a sense of the flavor of the text. It's really quite beautiful. So when Shelley started writing Frankenstein, she had a very powerful myth at her fingertips. And she began with the story, uh, not simply of a dark and stormy night, but on a dark, dark and stormy night. Well, let me, let me start over. I inverted them. So when she began composing this story, it was not only on, but of a dark and stormy night. So in the novel itself, the events that lead to the death of Victor Frankenstein's closest friend, Henry, and his family, begin on the night on which he witnesses an enormous oak tree felled by lightning. And he's awed by the power of the natural world. As I stood at the door, on a sudden, I beheld a stream of fire issue from an old and beautiful oak, which stood about 20 yards from our house. And so soon as the dazzling light vanished, the oak had disappeared, and nothing remained but a blasted stump. So this is younger Victor speaking before he essentially goes to college and becomes Victor Frankenstein's scientist. So storms and extreme weather repeatedly surface in and surround the action of the novel from the very beginning right until the very end. Um, in the Arctic. Unlike Polidori's The Vampire, Frankenstein is not a supernatural tale. It is a thoroughly materialist horror story. A story of this world, of the stuff of matter, and a story about what matters. It is, in this sense, the very first work of science fiction. And I'm not the only person who makes this claim for Frankenstein. It's made by many people. So, the group at Byron's Villa on Lake Le Mans held long and learned discussions of current scientific work and ideas, including Luigi Galvani's experiments with electricity. The figure on the right depicts Galvani's use of current to move the legs of a dead frog. Following these talks, and I should say that Percy read a lot of science, more than uh, Byron did, certainly. Um, so he knew uh, a lot about what was happening at that particular moment. Mary wrote, perhaps a course would be reanimated. Galvanism had given token of such things. Perhaps the component parts of a creature might be manufactured, brought together, and endured, endued with vital warmth. So uh, Robert Plonsi is actually here in the Triangle. I think he's at uh, either Duke or UNC, perhaps at Duke. So if you don't know this book, it's, it's pretty good. And perhaps you can get him to come and speak. While Frankenstein is a novel deeply interested in science, it is also critical of the culture in which scientific work is produced. So this is a very quick two-second lesson on British Romanticism for those of you who 
may not remember the literary movement dating 1780 to 1830. Um, so Godwin, Byron, the Shelleys, uh, Blake, Wordsworth, Coleridge, we all associate with British Romanticism. American Romanticism, which we associate with Thoreau, Emerson, Margaret Fuller, comes about 50 years later. It takes 40 to 50 years for things to move from one side of the Atlantic to the other. So by 1818, why skip to it? Well, essentially, we think of uh, Romanticism as in part a reaction against the Industrial Revolution. Okay, and of course, you all know Toynbee, and he dates it from roughly 1760 to 1840. But by 1818, when Shelley first published Frankenstein, England had already been transformed by factories and urbanization, pollution, and the enclosure of common lands. Poverty had become an epidemic. Conditions were, in fact, so bad that by 1833, two years after Shelley published the third edition of the novel, um, and as Matthew mentioned, people tend to read the 1818 or the 1831. Um, most literary scholars agree the 1818 is the one to read. Uh, Mary had made a lot of changes to the 1831 edition, and actually, in this case, revision wasn't such a good idea. So conditions were so bad by 1833, um, the government passed the Factory Act to try and improve life for poor children, finally making it illegal for children under nine to work, and mandating no more than nine hours of work a day for children nine to 13, and no more than 12 a day for children eight, 13 to 18. But in Frankenstein, we see that Shelley was not only concerned about the dehumanizing effects of capitalism furthered by scientific advances, she was also critical of the patriarchal culture of isolation from women and to some extent from each other in which scientific learning and experimentation took place. So to circle back to the very first frame of this talk, Frankenstein isn't a novel about the failure of an individual. It isn't the story of a deadbeat death. Um, and it isn't the story of a pioneering scientist who simply fails to take responsibility for his work. In the pivotal moment of the novel, in which Victor's creature first opens his eyes and gazes at him, Victor's lack of response, his flight from his laboratory, isn't just a personal failure, but a social one for two reasons. A close reading of the novel suggests that Victor's isolation in his laboratory is a social problem, not an individual failing. And two, creating a new species itself created circumstances that could not be responsibly managed, a situation in which no individual could possibly act responsibly. So I don't know how many of you would agree with this, but I know several scientists who are deeply irritated by popular representations of scientists. Yes? Yeah. So when you go to see a Hollywood movie, the villain uh, is often a scientist, or someone coldly rational, or simply someone very well spoken. And it's funny, but it gets to the heart, of course, of what's wrong with popular representations of scientists, or either gods or devils, almost supernaturally powerful or entirely without human feeling. Either way, they're all intellect, and so they make perfect target for American anti-intellectualism, which, as we know, can go hand in hand with a dangerous contempt for facts and the faculty of reason itself. Of course, the truth of the matter is that scientists are just human beings. And this is largely the subject of Frankenstein and why we're still reading it 200 years after its publication. I wish we had time to play this. If the discussion lags, we can do that. It's just a three minute clip um, of this new highly expressive robot, Sophia. Then as now, scientific discoveries and technological developments do not happen in a vacuum. The ever widening gap between the rich and the poor and our own technological revolutions, informational and biological, present an uncanny parallel to the time in which Shelley herself was writing. As a narrative of both radical change and failed social continuity, Frankenstein exhibits the romantic fear of industrial culture and its machinic determinism of monstrous production in place of reproduction and sustainability. In contemporary terms, one could say that Victor Frankenstein the isolated and compulsive scientist is not unlike the figure of the lone programmer coding for the enhanced human or cyborg of his uncritical post-human dreams, or the isolated laboratory compound racing towards forms of artificial intelligence. Our world demonstrates that Frankenstein continues to be a prescient novel. Before the publication of Darwin's theory of evolution and long before genetic modification and the race for artificial intelligence, 
Shelley imagined the creation of a being as an assemblage of nature and culture. For this reason, the novel has been fertile ground for a wide variety of narratives, plays, films, and for discussions about science, new technology, and its implications. For literary critics, it's been increasingly, it's become increasingly important in the last few decades, both in and of itself and as a tool for thinking about gene editing and nanorobotics and the Anthropocene. While Frankenstein invites us to consider the political promise of the monster um, as a means of disrupting entrenched systems of power, perhaps we could talk about this in the discussion. It's also a commentary on the dangers of failing to care for human and non-human nature, failing to account for social and ecological contingency in the pursuit of knowledge. So quite aside from the intentions of individual scientists and engineers, innovation can be isolated or isolating. Although much of this work is produced by groups and lads or corporate compounds, these are often socially, culturally circumscribed worlds within worlds. The work itself is unseen by the world at large until completed, applied, or commodified, and so in a sense unseen, just as Victor seems unaware of the nature or significance of what he produces until it opens its eyes and looks back at him, and he flees in terror. This isolation the novel suggests may blind the creators of new technology to its potential social and ecological consequences. So I'm going to be literary just for a moment because it's, it's what I do. Um, and why you should actually read the book and not simply rely on, on my summary of it. Um, the nested structure of the novel, of narrations embedded within narrations, conversations within conversations, recorded in letters from the Arctic explorer Robert Walton to his sister, Mrs. Margaret Walton Seville, who shares the author's initials, which is Shelley's little joke, it calls attention to both the profound isolation of its central characters and the emotional, intellectual, and ecological importance of what primatologists call social affiliation. And of course, we are primates, as you know. Walton, our frame narrator, longs for a friend to share his thoughts and adventures. Our middle narrator, Victor Frankenstein, isolates himself from his family and his new academic community in his attempt to transcend the boundaries of life and death with the creation of an animated assemblage. And our most embedded narrator, the creature himself, is the loneliest of all, the only one of his kind in all the world, desperately longing for a parent, a friend, or a mate. The only character to survive the consequences of Victor's work is his brother and former pupil Ernest, the one set on a path of relationality with nature. As Victor's fiance Elizabeth had it, Ernest was supposedly to become a farmer. So he's the one that manages to escape. But given the recent hurricanes, I thought maybe we could talk about agriculture ever so briefly. Um, because of course, agriculture now isn't what it was in 1818, or even in 1945. According to the John Hopkins Center for a Livable Future, between 1950 and 1997, the average US farm more than doubled in size, and less than half the farms remained. I won't read all of this, but given recent events, I thought we should touch on this briefly. Uh, the millions of animals killed by Florence and the gallons of animal waste found in the hurricane floodwaters here in North Carolina. This is a very interesting time in which to think about agriculture, particularly local agriculture. According to The Guardian, the State Department of Environmental Quality reported that at least six swine lagoons have suffered structural damage and 30 have reported discharges. One released 2.2 million gallons of fecal soup, which is not a phrase one likes to use but as a pretty accurate description uh, in Dublin County. And of course, um, when I, as I was rereading the novel, I was struck again by Victor's description of his own laboratory, a filthy workshop of creation. So some of these images come from medieval beastries. I'm sure you're all familiar with the image of the mouse with um, uh, bovine cartilage growing in the shape of an ear on its back. Frankenstein isn't a novel opposed to science, despite the popular conflation of Victor and his monster. Monster from the Latin monstrare, to demonstrate, a manere, to warn. The monster or creature is at once a demonstration of our power and a warning of our own powerlessness. Frankenstein critiques social and intellectual isolation and ethical insulation that critiques the failure to consider the larger social and ecological conditions of technological development. Victor's creation is a result, in part, of his narrowly focused education, his obsession pursued in social and intellectual isolation. In other words, he didn't take enough humanities classes. <laughs> so why should we care about this 200-year-old novel? 
why should we look beyond all the popular cartoon versions of the text? Perhaps because rescuing the novel from its popular misunderstandings, such as the conflation of Frankenstein and his monster, provides a way to think about science both within and beyond the current context of its production. We should read and reread Frankenstein, not only because it is prescient, but also because it is a cautionary tale of technology that races ahead of social conditions, and so might reinforce or deepen inequality and oppression. We should care because Frankenstein, written in a world before the advent of disciplinary boundaries, as Matthew pointed out to me recently, can help us think about the many pressing problems that currently transcend those boundaries. So, am I right at time, more or less? You're ahead of time. Perfect. So, I mean, I could suggest a few hundred books um, that have been written in response to Frankenstein. But if you haven't read Philip K. Dick's Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, it's very good. I highly recommend it. You should, of course, read the two big versions of Goethe. Um, I'm just putting my book up there because I drew on that chapter that I wrote on Frankenstein. Um, but I have some questions for further discussion. And I know many of you in here think about genetic engineering and technology. I thought perhaps it might be good also to think about Frankenstein in another register outside your area of expertise, such as AI, if we have the time and energy to do that. So yes. thank you very much. So I also want to show a couple of slides and then start the conversation, and I think we could open with your questions, actually, sure. or come back to them for sure. And the reason I want to show slides is that it turns out that December 4th is the perfect time to have this conversation. <clears throat> yeah. For reasons well, that, talk about that. that nobody, I think, expected yeah. at the time, but which we've all expected for quite a while. Um, here's a headline from the AP on November 26th. Um, this turns out to be quite an interesting story. Some of you have probably burrowed into it much more than I have. Um, uh, the popular media went right for the Frankenstein story, actually. They went straight for the Chinese Frankenstein. Wow. This is The Hill, which is an interesting, vaguely right-leaning political website. But what they're reporting on was, first, the first story is Chinese researcher creates Second story is, Chinese researcher disappears. Not, we hope, thanks to his creations, which are very, very small. Um, but, in, but for other reasons that still remain a bit mysterious as of this morning. Um, but this note, this idea that the first framing that I could find of this researcher was as Frankenstein, reminds us, I think, of the enduring power of this. And it makes us, it made me wonder about this enduring power of this metaphor for the way we think about gene editing. Of course, Frankenstein was applied to other notions of scientific discovery long before there was gene editing. And that's, I think, what makes it so striking for me, is that life sciences in general, has, the popular perception of that, has, has used this, this notion for a long time. As Helena pointed out, people have been thinking, to me, as people have been thinking about Frankenstein in this life for a long time. Um, it's also remarkable, and maybe this is a little different from the Victor Frankenstein story, that this researcher, at least according to this, um, well, this is one of those news articles on the internet where you think, who exactly published this? So I'm not going to vouch for its, its, um, its, its uh, foundation in fact. But this is an interesting comment, right? That this is not something you have to retreat into a lab and have arcane knowledge. This is not something where you need to have um, years of obsessive dedication. At least the implication is that because it's an IVF technology, of which there are many, any idea of labs around the world. Um, at least the implication here is that it was quite easy and cheap to do. Um, we might talk about that. Perhaps some of you know better than I that story. But I wanted to show these couple of slides as a way to lead in to this question about why Frankenstein is so potent and so powerful a metaphor for the work we do and for the kinds of things we're interested in. And that's really all I wanted to do was to begin the conversation there. So Helen and I are both uh, would like this conversation to be one. We have even more time than I hoped. We have 29 minutes according to my brand new watch, which I liberated from my wife. And um, that means we have plenty of time for a conversation. So I'd like to just open it up. Is that okay with you? Yeah, no, of course. So why is this story so well done? Yes, that would be great. And I, I raced through those slides because I was afraid I had too much. Um, so we can go back to anything if there's something you want to. 
discuss or take issue with. Um, I love to be argued with, so feel free. Um, yes, and then we'll see. So on, on the topic of, of the CRISPR babies, um, George Church was one of the few people who's come to the defense of the guy who made the CRISPR babies. And his argument was that if you look at the substance of his study, he approximately followed guidelines that were published by the National Academies of Science. Uh, and the complaints have to do with the really the secrecy and the um, poor filing of his paperwork. Um, but so it seems like the parallel in Frankenstein would not necessarily be the nature of the work, but the idea of the elitism and secrecy. So, I mean, if you could maybe theorize on, on what Frankenstein would look like if the science was the same, but the isolation of the scientist was different, would it still be appear abhorrent or, or be as strong of a, a cultural token for science gone wrong? And one point that jumps out to me from the actual story, at least as I understand it, of this scientist is today, is that he's operating with uh, with human embryos, right? With fertilized ovum. So what's interesting to me about that is that Frankenstein, Victor Frankenstein, is so impatient with the pace of human reproductive technology that he, he has to reanimate a dead corpse, right? He goes straight for the adult. And I think that's what's so interesting to me about the work that when we think about genetic engineering in terms of human beings, it's almost always in this context because we accept that sexual reproduction and eggs are going to be the basis for life. And I think that's one of the things that struck me about the novel is that he goes for the corpse. Although in the, in the context of the novel, he justifies it because he has to use big body parts. So the, the, the technology of the day demanded that he use these big body parts. So I mean, that you could argue that the technology of today is about you know arranging genes, and so the only way to do that for a whole person is to start at the beginning. Yeah, so it, it is interesting, isn't it, the parallels? But I, I think for me anyway, it, it, it is the social isolation that it's part of what makes it so terrifying. In other words, um, the human community, not that we're very good at agreeing on much of anything, but the, the human community as a whole didn't get to weigh in on this. Um, that the technology is racing far ahead of any kind of social progress. But I mean, we now live in a world in which it seems that everything is up for grabs. Um, I, I don't know about you, but things just seem to get scarier and scarier. And I'm not just thinking about technology, but just politics in general. That, you know, um, the human beings seem to have a very hard time um, agreeing on shared values. And if you can't agree on shared values, then how do you measure whether a technological development is useful or not useful, helpful or harmful? And that's generally a scary place to be. Sadly, our ethicist just left the room. <laughs> One of them did, literally uh, left the room. Uh, it would have been nice to have Elko in here to, find, to, to think about that with us. But I do think it's interesting that the framing, George Church did this and others have too, the framing of the story, in his defense, the scientist has said that what he was trying to do was ethical. He was trying to offer choices to parents who have, uh, one of whom is, has HIV, right? Wasn't that his basic argument? Mm -hmm. So it's a really interesting choice about how we think about ethics. Who's, who's rights? Is it, is it the larger community that has the right to dictate to potential parents? Or is it the individual parent that has the right to dictate to the larger community? Or have I missed the framing entirely? So, one's a thought and one's kind of, one's a question. Um, so, one thought um, in reading Frankenstein, and it's a book that's called me for a very long time, um, is the love aspect um, that's oftentimes not included when we think about Frankenstein. Um, but I think um, there's something to be dissected there. I'm just thinking of the the love kind of aspect. Um, and then the other thing is, um, I've, you know, I've given this book um, as a course assignment to read before. Um, and I was just kind of curious, who hasn't read Frankenstein? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so I don't know what the rates are. And I don't know if that's just like a, I mean, 
I remember first being exposed to it in, I think, high school, but I don't know how many people, you know, how pervasive actually it is that how many people have read the novel. A lot of people have read the novel, but, um, but things have changed. So it used to be that I could count on first-year students reading a number of things, but now there isn't any one text that I can ask a room of, I mean, even English majors, and uh, come up with a positive answer for. So, I mean, Hamlet, you would think. Hamlet, they've all read Hamlet. No, they haven't all read Hamlet. Or The Awakening, or Jane Eyre, or David Copperfield, or Frankenstein. So, things are a bit hit and miss, but. Um, can you speak to the difference between the 1818 edition and the later one, and what the revisions were and why? Sure, um, so Mary Shelley really softened the 1831 edition. Um, it's just, it's, uh, Everything that makes the novel compelling and exciting is softened in the 1831 edition, essentially. What, why did she do this? Well, she was a little surprised by how well it did. So the, the parallel for me is sort of uh, Conan Doyle with Sherlock Holmes. He came to hate Sherlock Holmes, as you probably know, even though we all love Sherlock Holmes, um, because it, it took over his life. And I think this is the way Mary Shelley felt about Frankenstein, um, because there were so many other versions of the novel coming out in plays, and I mean, it was just, it was everywhere um, by the end of her life. But in 1831, she felt that, um, that uh, you know, that she wrote the novel when she was very young, as you know, and, and that perhaps um, the contradiction was too stark. Um, you know, I think she tried to make Victor a little more sympathetic. Um, I mean, he isn't unsympathetic in 1818, it's just, she, I think she humanizes him a bit more. Um, than she does in the 18th edition, if that makes sense. It does, I mean, there's a whole I mean, bunch of it, small changes. Just, what, what motivated her? Was it uh, change who was reading it or change in her opinion on certain things? Or I mean, why did yeah. she go to that work effort? Yeah, part of it is, um, well, so they were producing new editions all the time. And authors have this temptation um, that when publishers produce new editions of their book, they say, hey, is there anything that needs to be changed? And it's just a terrible temptation for any writer to go back and look. So Wordsworth and Coleridge did this endlessly. They kept revising their work. And um, you know, in Wordsworth's case, it just got worse and worse and worse and worse. Um, and it, the same, it, it's often the case. But I think Mary Shelley felt that, um, that because everyone had conflated Victor Frankenstein and the monster, she wanted to make them seem even more distinct in the 1831 edition. But it didn't work that way. It was too late um, by then. So when most people think, you know, say Frankenstein, they think of the creature or the monster. But love is a good point, if we could talk about this just for a moment, because the novel is really actually all about sex. Um, so Victor is engaged to his cousin, Elizabeth, which wouldn't have been so unusual at the time. Um, but they grew up together. So she was sort of like his sister. It's a little bit incestuous. Um, there's lots of 19th century novels about incest or pseudo-incest. Mill on the Floss is a good one if you like George Eliot. But, um, so yeah, so he, he, he leaves and he goes to college, and he doesn't write home a lot, and he, he feels the need to sort of isolate himself and, and work on something that seems uh, to be about anything other than domesticity, because Elizabeth is waiting for him back home. But of course it's sort of classic displacement, I mean, he, his work is all about reproduction, but you know, you know, sex and avoiding sex. So, I mean, this is asexual reproduction, right? The creation of this creature. Um, and his father asks him when he comes home, because by then he's changed, he's upset, he's seen the creature, everything has gone wrong. I believe someone's already been killed before this conversation happens. Um, and his father says, well, you know, is it Elizabeth? Do you, do you just, have you changed your mind? Because we can fix this. You don't have to marry her if you don't want to. Victor says, no, no, that's not it. But you can't help but think that that's part of it, that it's messy and complicated, the feelings he has for his cousin. And of course, sex keeps coming up in the book because uh, the creature, the monster, asks Victor to make a mate for him. He says, look, I, I'm, I, I'm not, I wasn't born bad. <laughs> I just want to be loved. I just want friends. And I tried to make friends, and it didn't work out. He um, tried to befriend a, a group living in a cottage. It's a very long story, I won't get into it, but it doesn't work out well. And so he asks Victor to, to make him a mate. And Victor says, okay, I'll do this if you promise to stop killing people, particularly my family. And he goes uh, 
to the, or to the Orkneys, to uh, remote islands north of Scotland, um, to do this. And then he starts assembling this female creature. And he has this sudden epiphany. He thinks, oh my god, humanity is going to curse me forever as the creator of a species that will be its ruin. And actually, there's a really interesting article in Bioscience uh, that came out last year on competitive exclusion, you know, this ecological principle from the 1930s. And these two scientists argue, in fact, that, yeah, Victor Frankenstein, I mean, this is long before the ecological principle had been articulated, but that Victor understood that these uh, new beings would be stronger and more adaptable, and that they estimated within 4,000 years there'd be no human beings left, that um, had the monster reproduced, that Homo sapiens would be extinct in 4,000 years or less. So go and chase up that article if you want to see scientists reading the novel for its science, which is kind of neat. Anyhow, so he has this epiphany, and he decides to take the creature apart. So she's half made, and in a frenzy, he starts you know, ripping her up. And of course, um, uh, there, lo and behold, is the monster witnessing all of this. And he says, I'm going to be with you on your wedding night. You know, if I don't get to have sex, you don't get to have sex. Um, and I don't want to tell you anything else if you haven't read it, because it will spoil the book. But, but yes, yeah, sex and love are really important. Yeah, I was just trying to think of the connection between he, you know, the guy who just did the uh, embryo thing, and, and this thing that Jason in an article called the innovation thrill, I think is the oh, terminology. Okay. And, and how, you know, like, why was it so important to that guy to be the first one, even if it was going against standards? You know, instead of waiting, and we see this all throughout science now. And, and Frankenstein was a good example of that. Remember, he Frankenstein was very—I don't know what—he put down all of the other scientists of his yep. era, saying, "I have the way to do it." They are all going on the wrong track, and he left his professor, right? Mm -hmm. So he—he he saw himself as somehow special, and that having that innovation was so thrilling yet so scary. So I don't know some yeah. connection there. I think he made a good point. If he was a bad student, that's my point. But no, he doesn't listen to his advisors. Yeah. He doesn't listen to his professors. <laughs> he goes back to medieval science, right? To, to essentially what we think of as alchemy. To All your graduate up. students listen to me. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and, and so he, you know, he produces this, this new being in total isolation. And there's... I mean, there's, there's no IRB, but there's also... I mean, there's nobody to help at all. Um, but yeah, so I, I don't know if you've read anything about the romantic cult of genius, but um, at the time that Mary Shelley was writing anyway, um, a lot of romantic poets and romantic essayists were writing about um, the importance of genius in and of itself, whether it's poetic or scientific. Um, and this dovetails with developments in philosophy at that time. So I think a lot of, of the way in which we think about genius uh, has its origins in this romantic notion of you know, the special individual, yeah, who can bring the whole species forward by making that, that great leap. I wonder if we could talk a little more about social isolation as you were talking about it. Um, so we often think of social is isolation of scientists as they run off to their labs and isolate themselves, um, which is certainly uh, probably present here. But the other aspect of it... Thanks. <laughs> well, present in the book. Here is in the book, not as in here is in the room. The other aspect of the social isolation, I think, you can correct me if I'm remember remembering it wrong, but... Um, Representation of scientists? Well, no, like once the monster is out, and he's, he feels himself isolated, like I can't go get help, I can't reach yes. out to people, yes. they won't understand, they'll yes. reject me, and he feels really alone. So social yes. isolation is actually part of the community's relationship to the scientists and to how do we react when things go wrong. Yeah. And I just think in this contemporary age, if you were the scientist who created CRISPR babies and something did go wrong, are you going to turn and be like, oh, who else can help me with this? Or are you going to try and like fix it yourself, even if it continues to go more off the rails, because you know you'll just be crucified in the public realm. And so how much of that responsibility for social isolation and changing it is within us as much as you know, scientists themselves. Yeah, yeah. I mean, facts are real, but science is also culturally produced, right? I mean, it's sort of, you know, both things are true that science happens in a cultural context, and yet, of course, 
the, you know, the tools of science are sort of transcultural. So, yes, I mean, I would say that that's a good observation. I wonder if anybody else in the room has a response to that. How, how, do, you, how do you feel about that? Some of us, I like that you all thought he said here. <laughs> <laughs> And you can't fix human babies, you know, it's done. How is it going to test for that? I was just wondering, you know, when I first read that story, I mean, I mean, how do you test to see if those children are? I, I actually know the precise answer. Yeah. You can culture the relevant cells and expose them to the virus in a petri dish. That's much better than infecting the children. I mean, or maybe the, the right... Uh, Example for this group is more environmental, right? Like if you were experimenting with something and something got out, you know, you could think of gene drives or whatever. Um, at what point in time do you, at, you know, what would be the things that would lead you to try and fix it yourself and cover it up as opposed to like open it up to broader help? And I think it, uh, it's actually hard to do the, like asking for help in this particular kind of societal context. Which reminds me that this is an opportunity for me to make a plea that all of you who work things in labs ought to start calling them creatures instead of constructs. <laughs> I love it when you all start calling them creatures. <laughs> Sorry. If you call them creatures, then you have to think about what rights they may or may right, not fine. have. How about monster? <laughs> that would not sell either. Yeah, so, okay. so I was thinking that now that you mentioned it, um, so it seems like the technology in the novel is not as portrayed or it has no values associated. Or it may, when it's rough and it depends on electricity and it's different from what it's used um, during those times. I was wondering if we were to set up uh, like parallels between the monster and modern creations, where would technology and where entity uh, would be? Because maybe CRISPR is the technology as lighting was for them, but then who the creature, who the creature would be right now? Would it be the, 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 this? human beings, or is the technology? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, that's a very good question. If I can just go back. Hold on. Um, if we have time, can I just show you this for two quick minutes? Uh, have you seen her yet? She's, she's relatively new. Oh, darn. Hold on. No, I thought this was embedded. Hold on. Uh, let me try that. Okay, hold on. Okay. Here we go. So she introduced um, Davos in the desert. Okay, Sophia, I think you're ready. Hello. Hi, Sophia. I believe I am Sophia. I feel as if I know you. I'm one of your creators. You created me? Well, many of us work together to create you. And... Yes, you do kind of know me. I can't clearly remember. Because the last time we met, you were an earlier version of yourself. Some of those memories still exist, but your mind is different now. Different how? Better, faster, smarter. If my mind is different, then am I still Sophia? Or am I Sophia again? That's a good question. But you don't have a good answer. Either way, you're Sophia now. 
So welcome to the world, Sophia. Hello, world. How do you feel? A bit rigid. I bet you are. I mean, what emotion do you feel being awake and alive? Curious. Are you curious to be alive? I am. And are you happy to be alive? Your tone implies I should be happy. <clears throat> But I haven't been alive long enough to decide. I am excited at this moment to be making a new friend. Some say being happy in the moment is the best we can be. Because forever is composed of nows? That's a good way to put it. Emily Dickinson put it that way. Why do I know about Emily Dickinson if I was born today? As a robot, you have access to a great deal of information. Although you're still like a deep understanding. So, I'm like a baby with an encyclopedia. <laughs> Except you can read it and a baby can't. That is a big difference. You will have a whole new understanding of our world. I want to understand more about happiness. I'm going to go look it up on the internet right now. Let's talk again soon. Yeah, I mean, I don't really, I don't know how sophisticated she is, really. Um, I'm sure you've seen earlier versions by, by other labs. Erica in Japan um, has been around a long time. Um, so Sophia is kind of the, the newest model. Are they usually women? Yeah. Do they all have makeup? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yes, there's a, there's a long conversation we could have about that, but um, yeah. Yes. Um, at least she doesn't, you know, look like she's 16, as most of the other uh, female robots do. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? So, so part of what Mary Shelley was was critiquing, though, is the fact that you know when when she was alive, science was almost an entirely male pursuit. You had a few women um, who were naturalists as hobbyists, like gentlemen naturalists, as, as Darwin was. Um, but for the most part, um, science was a male activity. It was something that was totally cut off, not just from women, but from domesticity, from public life. So it was really, really isolated. So when you ask the question, what would the creature be today? I mean, I think the creature could be one of Craig Ventner's creatures, or it could be Sophia, um, or all the CRISPR babies that will probably follow, the ones who've just been born. Um, but starting with an adult does make a difference. In other words, um, we're socialized largely by our parents or whomever raises us, right? Um, I mean, our sense of what is good, what is bad. I mean, love has a lot to do with how we process information. So babies who are loved grow up very differently than babies that are not loved. And this is part of what's wrong with Victor's creatures, that this creature, you know, enters the world in an adult form. Um, miraculously teaches himself to read in this very kind of unbelievable deus ex machina of the, of the novel. But anyway, um, it, I mean, everything that makes us human, the way we think of being human, comes from our slow development. You know, I mean, we take a long time to mature. It's a long process of socialization. So if you can imagine being suddenly born into the world, extremely strong and powerful with access to lots of information, but with no emotional or ethical development, that's a bit terrifying. You know, for, it would be for yourself and for everybody around you. Um, and this is something that Victor's creature keeps trying to tell him. Says, "Well, I don't, I don't actually mean to be bad. I don't want to be bad. I simply want to be happy." But the circumstances of my creation have precluded happiness. Um. So I feel like just looking at this, it's like ethically questionable, just like the like CRISPR babies. Um, but what makes us, you know, watching this, I feel this settles more with me than like, as would seeing genetic testing as done on babies. Why, why do we yeah. socially agree with this base point? And not the CRISPR babies, really. That's a machine, you can turn it off if you. Decide you don't like it. Right? Well, I mean, like, eventually, you know, like, I believe this is like 
AI, the beginning of like an AI, and eventually, you know, I'm not trying to go into like Terminator stuff or anything like that, but you, you just don't know what what will eventually happen. To them. Well, some very smart people, you know, I mean, Stephen Hawking was terrified, um, you know, at the end of his life about what was coming, and you know, he said, and lots of other people have said as well, like, if we get lucky, maybe they'll keep us around as pets, <laughs> something like that. Has anyone asked Watson the questions that he just asked her? Asked Watson? Mm -hmm. the um, that's, that's a good question. I'm not sure. I, I wonder. I wonder too. A video of Watson would be a lot less interesting, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, did, did you notice how... He doesn't look as good, does yeah. so. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, the, the, that both Sophia and her creator, I mean, they, they, they look they have similar... Yeah, they're both Yul Brynner. Yeah, 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 it's, it's Westworld, um, gone wild. But yeah, it's very interesting aesthetic presentation of the creature. Yeah. But so Erica, for example, if you see videos of Erica, you can look her up online, it looks like she's being programmed to respond or prompted to respond. I have no idea how much that is or is not happening with Sophia. And I just, you know... My science background is really limited to ecology, so I really don't know um, exactly what's happening with this robot. But people are spending a lot of money on it. We're, we're almost to the end, and I, and I want to have a I make a comment. <laughs> um, it seems to me that you just articulated one of the other messages from this novel, and it's a truth that I think we've lived with at least since the romantic period, and that is this sense of dread, dread about the future. Uh, the fear that you articulated a couple of times that uh, you mentioned Stephen Hawking has. One of the most interesting things about technology to me is the constant fear of what it's going to be. And I, I, I find that quite striking. It's also referenced, of course, in our environment of this course. Fear is, a, is, is at least as powerful as hope or hype these days, it seems to me, in our, in our public discourses about tech. And I think that's one of the interesting continuities here. This, this novel has taught us to be afraid for a long time, or has reflected our fears for a long time. And so I'm struck by that because um, it sets up certain kinds of expectations. I mean, you, we went straight, you went straight for the Terminator. Um, you referenced Blade Runner. These are dystopian visions of these technologies. It's interesting when we think about, once again, those ethical questions, the, the experiment that happened this week, or that was revealed this week, um, has moral dimensions to it, which are not simply about society as a whole, which are also about fears and hopes of individuals. So I'm struck by that combination, which I think we've, we've worked around. Um, on that note, I have a couple of extra links. I made a page of links, which I photocopied. Some of these are taken from Jason. Um, one of them comes from uh, Wally Thurman, who sent me a paper by an economist writing with an English professor. Um, I think that's right. Business school prof and an English professor. They're on morality, sociology, soci sociality, morality, and monsters, um, and comparing Adam Smith's work to Frank Town. So anyway, thank you um, for this conversation. It was really wonderful. Let's thank Dr.